Residential schools sought to eliminate indigenous identities. The Indian Act seeks to legally define them. And as communities themselves endeavor to carry on their own culturally defined terms, in recent years, some high-profile cases have emerged of people claiming indigenous ancestry that they did not really have. With us to explore the question of who can claim to be indigenous, can we welcome, as is our custom from furthest away to closest to our studio, starting in Williams Lake, British Columbia, with Catherine Hensel. She is founding partner and principal lawyer at Hensel Barristers. In Wakefield, Quebec, Veldon Coburn, professor of indigenous studies at the University of Ottawa's Institute of Indigenous Research and Studies. And in Ottawa, Ontario, Gahande Horn Miller, assistant vice president of indigenous initiatives and a professor at Carleton University. And we're delighted to have you three on this program tonight. Um, normally, I just fire off a first question to get us going, but I think, um, I think we ought not to miss a potential educational opportunity here to do the introductions again. And maybe this time, you would all be good enough to introduce yourselves in um, using your indigenous names and which nation you belong to and doing it in the language that is consistent with your indigeneity. Let's see how this goes. Catherine, you want to start us off? Shem, Steve. Waikukwe, Catherine Hensel, Rinsquest. I am Shekwekmet, uh, a member of the, a citizen of the Shekwekmet Nation. And I'm actually coming to, or coming to you from Shekwekmet, Hulu, our, our territory and our nation. Wonderful. Cookchamp. Veldon Coburn, how about you? Uh, Kwe Megwich, I'm Veldon Coburn. Uh, I'm from the Algonquins of Pickwaknagon, and I'm coming to you live from my own territory here on uh, Algonquin Anishinaabeg Nation territory, just outside of Ottawa. Gahande. Gahande Yuja, Sakskare Watke Ni I Kanyaktahaka, Neo and Joto. Watkunuradun Danazogweko. I'm Gahande Horn Miller, I'm Bear Clan, I'm Kanyaktahaka, and I'm a guest here in unceded Algonquin territory. And the language you just spoke was? Konyageha, or also known as Mohawk. Wonderful. Thank you for indulging me in that. I thought that was uh, a, an interesting and different way to start our program. All right, let's get started. Catherine, what is the definition of who is Indigenous? Um, well, that's a, that's a broad question with a bunch of different answers depending on where you're coming from. But I think generally, uh, people who are uh, not only consider themselves to be and identify themselves as members of a nation and a culture, um, but also are claimed by and acknowledged uh, by, by the people of that nation and culture, whether it's through their family, the leadership, elders, um, and have a connection to, uh, if they are able, uh, have a connection to that, that community and culture. And it, it varies as well, uh, depending on which nation you're from, which culture, uh, who who can claim to be a member? Uh, for Shakwekmet people, if you are, if you have a drop of Shakwekmet blood, then you are Shakwekmet. All right, Veldon, is there anything you'd add to that? Yeah, I, I think that um, it, well, when Catherine mentions that it's something that's who's claimed, I look at it from a political lens. Is that these are uh, political communities where we have citizenship. It comes with a set of rights uh, and also attendant responsibilities. But the matter of being claimed, that's something that most nations uh, adhere to themselves. When being claimed, we typically hold identification from the issuing government itself. So the passport, which has become very popular, uh, you used to be able to cross borders through ports of entry into the United States, for example, from Canada with just a driver's license. But in the post 9-11 world, you have to present the documentation issued by the nation that claims you, which is the guarantee, which is now the passport. So you have to be claimed uh, and provided with that sort of guarantee to outside authorities. Gahande, is there general agreement among the many hundreds of First Nations in Canada as to what constitutes indigeneity? I think uh, we have uh, multiple similarities within our own um, traditional governance systems that we use. Of course, as my colleagues here have stated, it, it is about who claims you, but it's also too about who, who you are responsible and accountable to because there's um, you know, things that you have to, to, to live up to uh, in order to be a part of that community, but you have to, in a sense, um, uh, pr 
pr- prove or or live up to those responsibilities. And it's a lifelong thing. It's not just a one off. Um, so if if a community is claiming you, then uh, you have to you have to follow through. Uh, the the whole reason why I said in the beginning of the intro. Um, I wanted to point out was uh, about the fact that I placed myself. And I think that's where the very starting point is. If you go into any Indigenous community as an Indigenous person, the very first question that you are asked is, who's your mother and who's your father? And that is about placing you. That is about who claims you. So when I do my traditional greeting, that's about uh, situating myself and letting those others know who has claimed me, who who am I a part of? Who is my family? Who is my clan? Who is my community? And so there's those unspoken things that we do that are common uh, throughout Indigenous communities and Indigenous nations that uh, set the tone and allow us to, to be placed. Veldon, maybe let, let me use an analogy of religion here and you tell me how far this sort of goes or doesn't go. For example, if somebody wants to convert to Judaism, or they want to convert to Christianity or Catholicism. You go through the process, you do it, and once you've converted, I mean, quote unquote, you're in. Does it work the same way in the indigenous world? Uh, well, under the current constraints, it's it's far difficult, far more difficult to do that. Uh, there are processes for, and, and in many, even under Indian Act ban systems where there are custom elect, uh, citizenship and membership codes for people who are racially non-Indigenous, those who might not have blood, to become members and citizens within our nations. I know people who are citizens uh, that have been you know, brought in, and not through sort of like hokey uh, procedures of adoption, but uh, what we would understand is naturalization, and those procedures had existed before, just as any other political community around the world would have. Um, a good colleague of ours mm-hmm. that we work with, uh, Dr. Damian Lee, and he's been very public about it, is uh, racially not at all Indigenous. He's racially a white man, but uh, is a citizen of uh, the Anishinaabe, larger Anishinaabe nation, but for his particular First Nation as well, um, has been accepted through their custom governance system. So... It's not something you could pick up on the fly and self-identify. So it, it, there is still the matter of having the institution claim you. So we, we do see in, at the outset when you were giving the introduction is that people are making these claims, but it's not in accordance with the rules. It's not a soup kitchen and it's not fast and loose. Um, I can't pick up a book and, and start, I don't know, picking up and praying to whatever deity it may be and thinking that I am that religion and... Uh, or maybe the analogy fails at that point, but I, I think I'll just leave it at that at that matter that um, there are more rigid rules that entail governance, but unfortunately they've been eroded and uh, we're trying to rebuild them at these times with our systems of governments. Right, we'll, we'll go on actually to talk uh, later in our conversation about some of the examples that you just referenced, but I, I guess we should say Damien Lee was adopted by an indigenous family, which was why he was, I see you nodding, Veldon, which is why he was welcomed in uh, in that c- circumstance. Let me ask Catherine, though, are, are you recognized at the moment as a member of your First Nation? I'm recognized, uh, it's my understanding anyway, I'm recognized by the Shaquetman people as Shaquetman. I am not a status Indian. Uh, I'm not registered, on, therefore, on any band lists within our territory. Uh, none of my antecedents have ever been um, held status under the Indian Act. We are. We know who our families. When I walk into a Shaquetman gathering or community, uh, I, I identify who my family is, my families, the family lines that I come from, um, and I'm there, thereby uh, recognized. I know my relatives. Uh, but are you and, not on the list because you grew up so far away from Shaquetman territory? Um, no, there's people outside of our territory who are on the list, and I certainly have cousins who you know have comparable. Uh, ancestry who who have sought and obtained Indian status. Um, it's a choice uh, three, four generations ago uh, within my family uh, to not necessarily move outside the territory initially, they did eventually, but to step outside of that system uh, as it was being set up in our territory. And nobody's, to the best of my knowledge, none of my direct antecedents or ancestors ever held Indian status. So 
Um, and are you trying to claim that status I, now? No, no. There's a, a, for my citizenship uh, is between me and my people and my nation. And I, uh, I don't consider it subject to the discretion of a minister, a uh, Canadian member of cabinet. I, and, you know, as you saw with, with Lynn Gale's story, the rules applied to it are arbitrary or not even arbitrary in some cases, you know, kind of a sinister colonial construct. I don't really want to make my children, my grandchildren's identity and citizenship subject to that system. Okay, let's play a clip at this stage here because we want to do a plug for a TVO original series called Unsettled, which is the story of a woman who was taken from her northern Ontario territory during the 60s scoop. She found her family. She is trying to, quote unquote, reclaim her ancestry. So let's have a look at that clip. Sheldon, if you would. First, I want to thank my mother, Molly, for never giving up hope. I think your prayers gave me the strength to go on this journey and find my way back home. Also, miigwech to all of you for being here and supporting my family as we begin this journey together. I was very lucky. I grew up in a loving home and I have two beautiful children. You're not welcome here. Okay, that's from Unsettled. Airs Sunday, 9 p.m., or of course you can go to our website, tvo.org, follow the searches, and uh, watch it anytime on your own. Um, okay, Gahande, if someone wants to reclaim their Indigenous ancestry, should they? Boy, that's a big question. That's a loaded question. I think that, you know, traditionally, we're not in a position right now, I think, um, within our own communities to answer that question fully, um, you know, with the implications of the Indian Act system on our traditional governance practices, they ha it has deeply eroded the systems that we already had in place um, many generations ago to uh, address these kinds of issues. I think that there's a lot of disunity um, in our communities that comes out of uh, the implications of what we've experienced through time with um, the issue of uh, the imposition of a, an, another system of governance on on our peoples. Just so help right us understand now, why that that's a very question is so question. fraught. Yeah, t help us understand why that's such a fraught question. Because it relates to the issue of money and it relates to the issue of land and territory and sovereignty and we're in such a state right now that we we are in no way ready to answer that. Uh, you know, right now, we 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 are just uh, you know struggling um, to address questions around missing and murdered Indigenous women. We're we're struggling to address issues of uh, you know addictions, uh, survival, the very issue of survival in our own communities, clean water. And identi the identity question is something that is there. It's been there for a long time, and it's it's a very difficult one to answer. But there's many other things that are pressing on the ground that we need to address. And this this whole identity question just adds to that mess, is what I would call it. Hmm. it it's certainly a very complex issue, as uh, Drew Hayden Taylor, the playwright, described in his recent piece in the Globe and Mail. Uh, Velden is smiling already because he knows where we're going next. So let me read an excerpt from that column, and then we're going to come back and chat. Sheldon, the graphic, if you would. Most people, he wrote, in the Indigenous community are actually not fond of the quote-unquote blood quantum issue, or the degree to which an individual can prove a certain amount of Indigenous blood. It's unreliable and misleading, but many believe it's still better than nothing. You have to start somewhere. Let's unpack this. Velden, blood quantum, what is that? Uh, it's a really insidious form of uh, constructing an arbitrary cutoff on who's Indigenous and who's not. So for the longest time, and, and even there's sort of in a de facto way, the Indian Act has a blood quantum. It doesn't come out and explicitly say it. So basically it is a, a quantum. It's a quantum measurement of, of blood. It could be expressed in percentages or fractions, so degrees of being mixed. In the Indian Act, uh, as it currently stands from the amendment in 1985, is if you mix and 
you know, it, it's a it's a larger discussion too, but there is a calculus behind it. If you mix too many times, and what we understand now being the second generation cutoff, uh, you know, mm -hmm. so if you have like a status Indian who mixes, two, there's two generations of mixing with non-status, that's the end of it for status itself. But, um, you know, you'll, you'll hear sort of turns of phrases of being uh, I'm a full-blooded Indian or I'm half or they may be off the cuff themselves. But when they're worked into citizenship codes and membership or at least the, uh, the statutes and the laws that are imposed upon us by the state, it's very insidious. It's uh, what you might call and it's used another turn of phrase amongst ourselves, arithmetic genocide, is that it just basically creates the terminal end of when you have breeded yourself out of existence. Catherine, what's your view on it? Yeah, I agree. Um, like, in order to continue exi to exist as people, you need a bunch of things. You need territory, you need culture, you need language, but first and foremost, you need people. And uh, the Indian Act status regime uh, is systematically and methodically and intentionally reduces the number of people down to nothing in some cases. So um, I... You know, as I, I said earlier, I don't want to make either my own citizenship, my children's citizenship, or or uh, my my nation's ability to claim us subject to that. And the path, of course, is for um, is for nations to reclaim jurisdiction, exclusive jurisdiction about how they define citizenship. You know, and the the rights and obligations that that come from citizenship. And it'll be different. Like I, I know with Haudenosaunee, territory, uh, Haudenosaunee nations and the citizenship uh, regimes around there, they're very different than than what I think the Shikwekmik citizenship um, system and law and jurisdiction, how that would be exercised. And that says it should be. We are different people. We have different laws. You mentioned, Catherine, that language uh, ought to be a part of it. And I know you are, at least I think I know, you're trying to learn yeah. <laughs> Shikwekmik right now or Shikwekmik Sin. Yeah as the language is called? Chin, yeah. Chin. Yeah. How are you managing? Um, I'd say, you know, they say for, for a language like Chiquet Machine, for, a, for, an, for an English speaker, it's about 5,000 hours. And I believe that to be true. I'm probably about 1,000 hours in, let's put it that way. So you got so a way I'm, to go. I'm a toddler, linguistically, <laughs> I'd say. Gahande, you sounded absolutely perfectly fluent in your language, uh, when I asked you to introduce yourself off the top, how did that happen? Yeah. Well, I spoke only Gonyogeha until I was uh, five or six. And uh, when my mother moved us to Ottawa uh, for work, we were placed into uh, the school system that forced us to begin to learn uh, French and English. And I lost a lot of my language. But uh, since I started having children, I've taken the time to begin to reenact the language in uh, my family. And so that uh, legacy of the language is still there. So I can read it and I can pronounce it. And uh, But the actual uh, memorization of certain terminology and concepts is still very difficult for me. But uh, it's there. And that's why I sound quite fluent, because I'm, I'm getting there. How interested or not are your children in picking this up as well? Very interested. Uh, my eldest is fluent, uh, fluent speaker. And uh, my other two, one of them has a child and she's beginning to practice it with her daughter. And then uh, my youngest is uh, beginning to, to see an interest in it. Okay. Veldon, let me ask you about a case that you're researching right now, membership with your own First Nation, which involves the city of Ottawa as well. Um, big treaty, membership of more than 1,000 people. What's happening with all of that? So this will go to the question of ancestry and, and who can claim to be members of political communities for exercising rights and modifying territorial title. So as Catherine says, you know, nations and, and it's basically the international Westphalian model too of nations of, of having jurisdiction over a people within a bounded territory. So constituting the body politic, who are the citizens, they're the ones that have the uh, rights to modify and make sort of changes to how they constitute themselves. This is the sort of same thing that goes all around the world. Um, for example, and just to preface what's going on in uh, the Algonquin Nation in Ontario, because it is the largest modern treaty in Ontario's history, very close to concluding within a couple of years anyways, and 
38 years underway, 30 years of negotiations at the moment for 36,000 square kilometers, is that we have individuals who are claiming to be Algonquin solely for the purposes of modifying uh, Algonquin territorial title. Because it's unseated, we've never had a territorial treaty. We may have diplomacy treaties with the Crown from several centuries ago, but nothing that modifies the territory. And when I think about what they're doing is they have individuals coming out of the woodwork claiming an ancestor from the 1600s and that being sufficient to extinguish and modify my rights and our collective title. Now, I also have a great grandfather that's, well, three times great grandfather that married um, one of my great, great grandmothers from Scotland. And a few years ago, I that was an insufficient basis for me to modify or participate in their independence a referendum. And that was a, a significant move that a citizen can take and, and engage with the state to modify territorial integrity and um, their relations with other nations. So what we have here is a, a number of individuals coming out. And in fact, the, the research that we had done showed that uh, they were forging documents from the uh, 19th and 18th century. So early 1800s, late 1700s. And there's a number of individuals that are reliant upon this, over a thousand. The number is actually much higher now, but um, my little community has been drowned out in democratic numbers when it comes time to ratifying the final agreement, because they did ratify the agreement in principle in 2016, the culmination of 25 years of negotiations. Which... Okay, let me let me jump in with a follow-up yeah. then. If, if, <laughs> if these descendants are legally recognized, what do you think is at stake? Uh, well, you know, the ability to maintain ourselves as a nation with uh, a recognized territorial foundation for us. Uh, we're not sovereignists and we're not separatists. Uh, we still want to exercise our rights, but as it's going, the, uh, those individuals that come out, they vote overwhelmingly to extinguish our, our, our rights and title. So it'll be ceding it hmm. to the Crown and... Mm -hmm. Gahande, I, I suspect there are many white people watching us right now who assume that there are great benefits to having a status card. And I wonder if you could weigh in on that and tell, if, tell us if that is in fact the case. It's just a card. <laughs> many people think that, <laughs> many people think that, uh, you know, the card gives you great benefits in terms of tax uh, reductions and whatnot. It, it really doesn't. Like anybody else, I pay taxes. I work here in Ottawa at Carleton University, uh, that card really doesn't help me in terms of reducing, uh, you know, purchase price on items and things like that. Um, and and to me, that tax card is a, is a symbol of, um, of of colonial occupation. It's a symbol of the oppression of our people, and we are forced to take that. We are forced to to apply for these cards and prove who we are in in that system, in that other system. Um, but it really doesn't do very much. And, and it seems to weigh, have a lot of weight in terms of uh, non-Indigenous uh, eyes and those who, who co covet them. All right, let me introduce another controversy that has been all over the media of late, and that has to do with Carrie Bourassa, noted health researcher, University of Saskatchewan. She is currently on leave because the Métis ancestry that she claimed to have is now being questioned. And I want to go back to Drew Hayden-Taylor, again, writing in the Globe and Mail in that same article. He said, people, settlers, if I must be blunt, show up and casually assume the mantle of indigeneity, sometimes even more successfully than those they imitate. That's what riles up our people. Just because you might know how to dance at an intertribal, make a decent bannock, that's a kind of bread, and get beaten up by the police, doesn't make you indigenous. It's so much more than that. To me, indigeneity is a combination of both nature and nurture. Let's unpack that. Catherine, what do you think he meant by all that? It, that you do see, uh, particularly in professional circles, academic circles, and in the arts, um, people who are have claimed, as, as it appears Dr. Barassa has done, um, claimed an indigeneity that's vague and turns out to be in, inaccurate. And it's because the foundational premise is inaccurate and untrue it everything you build on top of it it doesn't matter how 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 much you learn everything you build on top of it is built on that really shaky um illegitimate foundation so 
It means that the identity that you've built for yourself professionally, academically, uh, and, and personally in a lot of cases, um, it's based on a lie. And that that's very problematic. It's problematic for the people who you're claiming to be uh, a member or the, who you, where you claim citizenship. It's problematic for other Indigenous people. And I think it's most first and foremost problematic for the individual, uh, for the actual individual. They, they, you know, it's caused, it's the structure that they built their life around is, is, has no integrity. And, and that's a huge problem for them. Veldon, uh, I'm not sure how to put this other than to ask, are there people in your experience who kind of fetishize indigeneity? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I can't real. it's difficult to comment on the personality type, but you see them substitute uh, the sort of skillful emulation, the parody and caricature that they produce for themselves mm -hmm. of just almost as exactly what uh, Drew had mentioned in his articles. They become skillful uh, performances, a whole production with oftentimes really fraudulent personas that they develop for themselves with a fraudulent backstory. And, and the arts and academia are particularly bad. Their institutions are so spectac spectacularly poor at understanding and just accepting anyone that um, it embraces charlatans. So you can have skillful individuals who are deceiving other people and making these you know, brazen misrepresentations of what it involves to be Indigenous. So no matter what sort of food or dress they put on, like they, you know, they put on the feathers and the leather and they think that's enough that um, they can convince others. But it, it goes back to the idea of um, claiming or interfering with the distribution of benefits and burdens, especially the ongoing dispossession of Indigenous peoples, like mentioned the Algonquins here, but it goes on elsewhere too. So uh, claiming rights uh, which they don't really have and uh, furthering the colonialism of Indigenous peoples. Well, you say it goes on elsewhere, and it, and it does remind me of the example, I can't remember how many years ago now, maybe 10, where a woman who was the head of the NAACP um, mm -hmm was white, but claimed she was black because she felt black and she headed a black organization. And, you know, Catherine, uh, the answer to this question may be obvious, but uh, why do you find that so problematic? Well, as I said earlier, it's based on on something that is, is just factually untrue. And, and it's also a um, manifestation of absolute privilege to think that as a member of the dominant culture, the colonizing culture, that you can just step in and claim for your own um, that which does not belong to you, does not belong to your family, and and then get the benefits that is in the, the sense of belonging and, and identity without actually um, the accountability. In the case of Indigenous people, we are deeply, deeply accountable uh, to our people, to our nations, and, and within our territories and outside of them. I, that's what I, I believe anyway. And if you don't have that accountability, then you sh certainly shouldn't uh, shouldn't be claiming any any entitlement. Gotcha, Gahande. Are you seeing more people in your experience legitimately trying to connect with whatever indigeneity they have in themselves? I am. I, I receive uh, messages through Facebook often from people, uh, you know, family people who say they're part of my family, the Wide Horn family or the Miller family, um, and. They they want to know who they are. I think that's one of the things that we're grappling with here is that people find are wanting a, a place to belong. Um, you know, even Europeans who came here are, are dispossessed from their own lands, and claiming another identity or claiming an identity is is part of that uh, effort to belong somewhere. And Indigenous peoples, you know, we have a long history. We have we have traditions. We have ceremonies we have stories that uh, place us here and we know who we are and we know where we belong and people want a little bit little piece of that on the other side of things you have those who want access to the large funds that are are made available to uh indigenous people to to go to school uh to li you know living on reserve access to funding for housing things like that i mean it's it's not a great uh, story there but um i think those are the two things that we're grappling with is 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 is, is the two different ideas around uh, claiming and um, access to money having said that Veldon, how much do you worry about the future of first nations in canada if current rules mean 
that fewer people are going to have citizenship in the future? Uh, well, we're examining that right now in my own community, the Algonquins Pickwaknagon. So part of the uh, modern treaty negotiations have opened up to explore self-government and one of the proposals being put forward is uh, a new citizenship code which wouldn't be reliant upon uh, necessarily you know proving some sort of blood quantum or indian status so getting rid of that and having a non-terminal uh, sort of gem generation is that you wouldn't ever breed yourself out of existence because as it stands the demographic projections for my little small community of 3200 uh, status indians it's going to decline um and uh, we will cease to exist probably by the end of the century, perhaps with the rate of what they would call, um, and, and use air quotes around it, out marriage, as it were. Um, so having non-status produce offspring and progeny with um, with our membership. So um, hmm. it, yeah, it's it's a it's the eventuality that was worked into the whole calculus of things. Catherine, we've got it's about a very a very problematic issue. Indeed. I, I just want to point out something that, you know, we we do have mechanisms traditional in our traditional governance systems to address these issues. For example, in the Guyana de Goa, we have the adoption procedures that ask you to learn how to be accountable to the community of people, to your to the clan that adopts you. It takes three generations for someone to come back in and their descendants learn the language, learn the culture, learn the ceremonies, uh, all of these things that that strengthen the community as a whole and you know we have those mechanisms they're already there they've been used in the past and they've been erased through colonization i think it's it's the time is now to to re-engage with our traditional ways and see where where can we make this fit how can we make this work within this century that feels like a great place to leave this discussion. I want to thank the three of you for coming in tonight and helping us understand all of these very complicated issues so much better. Catherine Hensel, Veldon Coburn, Gahande Horn-Miller. I'm grateful to the three of you. Thank you. Miigwech. Miigwech. Yeah, well. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.